We'll figure it out. All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Welcome to Stump the Pastor. No, it's not. Um, so anyway, we are, uh, we're continuing our conversation on uh, this, this class, Google Lutheran. And uh, I, again, the whole premise of this class is basically that, uh, you know, if you Google Lutheran, you're going to get a lot of stuff, right? You'll get a lot of various and sundry things. And uh, so really the purpose of this class is to separate the noise from the substance, right? To really define, you know, what is the essence of the Lutheran church uh, versus kind of the fluff, okay? Um, so last we, and really, you don't have to look too hard to figure out um, that what we're talking about is Martin Luther's solas, right? Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, Jesus alone, uh, for God's glory alone. We're basically going to be talking about those things because at the end of the day, that's what it means to be Lutheran. That's what it means to be Christian, by the way. Um, but um, there's there are some other pieces as well that we'll talk about, but but essentially these are the essential things about what it means to be a Christian or what it means to be Lutheran. Okay. So um, last week we talked about uh, the, the, um, the whole concept of um, revelation versus re, uh, reason, and the the thought that you know basically God's word is His revelation to us, and there are specific points and places in the Bible that maybe we don't like, or maybe we don't understand, or that we struggle with, or um, there are even things statements in the Bible that God makes that. Um, that are just completely outside of, uh, outside of our experience, right? Um, most notably, as we talk about the whole concept of, of we are saved by grace through faith, right? Um, every other aspect of our lives, as I like to say, from the moment that we are born to the moment we die is about performance. And yet God comes to us and says, you're saved by grace. I'm going to do it in a minute. Just there's some pushy broads in this place. <laughs> I know. Oh, and I'm married to one of them. So that's uh, anyway. What? No, I'm just saying. Yeah. Anyway. Before I really get myself in trouble, I'm just gonna just get back right on right back on track. Okay, so anyway, um, so that's what we're, essentially what we're talking about. Uh, again, the Bible has got a lot of things. It's, yeah, okay. Somebody's texting me now, and yeah, okay. Uh, let the sarcastic comments begin. Um, anyway, so we're. Yeah, I know. Sorry. So anyway, uh, uh, again, the Bible does say some things that, that we have to really struggle with sometimes because it's outside of our experience. Or maybe it's outside how we normally think. Okay. And, and so anyway, we were talking about that um, last week and how even when the Bible says things that are outside of our experience, guess what? The Bible still calls the shots. Okay. So today we're going to talk about uh, this whole concept of do versus done, and we're going to be focusing on this over the next couple of weeks. But I did want to start off today. Thank you very much, Debbie, for reminding me. I did want to start off today by a couple of uh, uh, just spend a couple of minutes talking about what's Jesus been doing, how's God been messing with you, uh, what's been going on in your neighborhood and your community, uh, and I, did, I want to share a couple of things that's been going on with me um, and in my neighborhood. Um, so it was, I think it was Monday. I was walking to the gym and which is about a third of a mile from my house. And as I was walking to the gym, I, uh, Jeff was out in front of his yard and we just, we sat and talked for a little bit. Um, the reason I walked to the gym is so that I can talk to the people in my neighborhood, right? That's the only reason it'd be much easier to drive, but I'm, I'm going to walk so I can talk to the people in my neighborhood. So sat and talked to Jeff. Um, they're an interracial couple. They moved down here um, about maybe six months ago to be close to their three grandchildren. Um, and his wife is a retired teacher 
And so she is in the house now doing the whole virtual teaching thing with the kids, with, with the grandkids, uh, because, you know, their parents are, uh, so anyway, Jeff and I were sitting there talking and we start talking about um, how he's got all this band equipment in his house. He's like, yeah, I've been, I've played bass since I was like 16 or 17, right. In Indiana. And, you know, we played in all kinds, played in all kinds of rock bands and stuff. And, and, and I was like, really, that's, and so we were talking about, it. you know, I'm a drummer and all that kind of stuff. He's like, oh yeah, I've got, I used to have a drum kit in here and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Tom, who's his next door neighbor, his brother plays piano. I'm like, huh, this is kind of interesting. He's like, oh yeah, I used to play in bands all the time, played in church all the time. And I went ding, 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 ding. Okay. <laughs> So here's there. Okay, let's just go that way. All right. So let's. So are you still playing at church at all? And he said, No, nah, I really haven't for a while. But you know, I'd like really, really like to get back into that. Ding, 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 ding. I'm like, oh, awesome. That's fantastic. We've got a guy who plays at our church who is a bass player. Who really, is fantastic. Uh, you know, you should come and listen to him sometime. That'd be great. <laughs> so anyway, we'll see how that goes. And then uh, that was kind of the fun one. And then. Um, Friday, yeah, Friday, uh, I had Vanya and Becky over at our house. We're doing some staff planning. Um, after they left, I was outside, uh, just kind of looking at some stuff out in the yard. We were trying to grow some grass in a couple of different places, looking at things. And, um, uh, James next door to us was out mowing his lawn. So he got done. I was still outside. Hey, James, what's going on? How's it going? So I went over and talked to him a little bit, um, and he he looked in the garage um, where his wife's car is usually parked, and he says, "I don't know if you noticed, but Kelly's gone." And I said, "No, I haven't noticed." And he said, "Yeah, she left about two weeks ago." Um, the young couple just had, you know, they've got a baby that's about two years old. Um, not even, not even well, same age as Harper as, uh, Chris, Chris and Alan, uh, Chris and Courtney Allen's daughter. Um, and so we sat and talked about that and it, you could tell this dude is broken. He's hurt. Um, so we just sat and talked for about 10 minutes. Um, and the thing I didn't do, which I was, you know, Greg Finke is in my head now. So the thing I didn't do was I didn't say, hey, James, can I just pray for you real quick? Okay. It's all right. We'll get there. Um, invited him to sports page on Monday. So we'll see what, how, how that goes. But it's okay. Now now there's, there's a guy that I need to connect with. Anyway, so that's what's going on in my neighborhood. A um, couple of really interesting things happening. Um, I'm looking forward to this week because my neighborhood does Halloween big. I mean, we've got lights. We've got big, huge mammoth spiders on the sides of houses. We've got ghouls. We've got all kinds of stuff in my neighborhood. And so it's a great time to just kind of get out and talk to people, right? Um, and every year we have, we, we go out to the end of our driveway and we set up three stations. There's the little kitty station. There's the big kid station, which is like the full size candy bars and all that kind of stuff. And the high school kids go nuts for that, right? They've got the big stuff, right? And then we have the adult station. <laughs> huh? It has ice in it. It is chilled. It's very chilled. So anyway, um, so we, we, you know, we have a little fun with <clears throat> Halloween in our neighborhood. So anyway, um, and I know Linda was telling us that, you know, her cul-de-sac too is everybody's getting out to the, out onto the edge of their driveways and, and going to have, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just go out to the end of the street and, and just hang out together. Yeah, so this, this is an, a neat week to be able to do some of that kind of stuff. As, as you're doing Halloween, ask the question, what is Jesus doing? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, the, the church for all of its life has stolen and grabbed a hold of, you know, cultural events and hallowed them. 
Uh, anyway, what's going on with your neighborhood? What's Jesus doing in your in your neighborhood? Yeah, Debbie. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna do this. Keep talking. Keep talking. They want to hear you, really. In the last couple of weeks, I have realized that it doesn't matter what the vessel is that God uses for you to meet someone. And in my case, apparently it's my license plate. Uh -huh. My license plate says, I love pie, as in cake and pie. And this past week alone, um, I've had two neighbors and a stranger in a parking lot at the grocery store stop me. One lady said, could I please take a picture of your license plate? <laughs> I said, sure. And, but my neighbors, that was, that was really what got me was the neighbors. These are folks that I see. We have lots of walkers with dogs and children and bicycles and things. And so these are folks I see, but don't normally get to talk to. And I was headed out yesterday and um, lady with her daughters and a, and a new puppy. And she said, I just love your license plate. And we talked about it. I said, what's your favorite pie? She said, oh, my favorite is cake. So anyway, <laughs> but it, it's okay. But it's a, it's a conversation starter. Yeah, sure. And it may take three or four encounters in order to get to where I want to get. Right. But with somebody that has been blessed with a gift of gab that I have, um, it won't take me long to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Awesome. Other things. Um, and for those of you who guys are on Zoom, if you want to just put some in the chat box and tell us about what's going on, um, you can do that as well. Uh, just and I'll I'll read that out to to folks that are here. <clears throat> Anything else going on? What's Jesus doing? How is he messing with you? Nothing. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Beth. Awesome. <laughs> it's just so cute. My daughter a couple of years ago gave Craig um, socks, funny, silly uh -huh. socks, corn on the cob, hot dogs, pizza, all sorts of things. And one of his friends noticed the socks. And the next time they met together, brought him a pair of Luther quote socks really? in German, awesome. which tickled me. So We've been racking our brains because we feel like it's a talk about a conversation starter. And, you know, you don't, I'll often take a picture of him driving, I'll shoot his feet to send back to the kids who sent him the socks. But I was just thinking, wouldn't it be fun to sort of, you know, show your socks or, or maybe bring the next person a pair of socks that he has to wear sure. that maybe aren't as conservative as Lutheran socks, <laughs> but I think it'd be fun. I think it might be a talk about conversation starter. It's like, oh, those are cool socks. Oh, let me tell you. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to tell on John Seema for a second. <laughs> Jenna and Tim are on here. So you can, you can tell them that I was telling on John today. So he's got a pair of socks that say, this meeting sucks. <laughs> which are perfect, right? Um, <laughs> I can't imagine sitting in a meeting with John and looking down at his feet and just, yeah, yeah. Anyway, talk about conversation starters. Anyway, okay. So we, we hey, I'm telling you, I, uh, I'm sure that God is gonna do some stuff this week. Okay, I'm sure of it. Um, so keep uh, your eyes on it and see what happens and tell us what's going on. So. Carolyn uh, and Barry tell the, uh, uh, sent this in. Uh, a new family moved in next door. The new neighbor asked Barry about the grass, which was a good opportunity to start a conversation. Okay, good, awesome. Um, yeah, cool. Jesus is gonna do some stuff this week. All right, good. So again, last week we talked about this whole concept of um, uh, revelation versus reason. Now today we are going to continue, and, and the point is, more Jamie, if the, if the Bible is the source and the norm of our faith and life, 
then there are some other things that we need to consider with what the Bible tells us that are essential for being Lutheran. Uh, and as, as we uh, start to get into uh, conversations with folks and they ask the question about, you know, what does it mean to be Lutheran? What it, or maybe even what does it mean to be Christian? What we're going to be talking about today and for the next couple of days and next couple of weeks, I think is really essential. Okay. Because obviously the Bible is, you know, is the source of our faith and, and it's God's revelation to us. But what the Bible tells us is how do we get in a relationship with him? And that's where this whole construct of do versus done comes up that we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So I, I've, um, for those of you who are on Zoom, you should have access to the, um, to the lesson that uh, um, Vanya, you can just bring that up. Uh, this, it's the same, same document you had last week. Okay, just bring that up. So if you, if you take a look at, six, at page six in the notes that you have, um, I asked this question, question to get us rolling, right? So how do, we, how do you define and measure success? Um, the Christian church has always struggled with the tension between faith as a passive thing and faith as an active thing. Put another way, the Christian church has struggled with how it answers the question, what does our salvation look like? What does a Christian look like? How does the Christian church know if it's being successful, right? If Jesus um, says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the, oh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. Well, how do we know how we're doing with that? And, and the Christian church has always struggled with answering that question because it's not something that you can necessarily have a scorecard for so that you can know precisely and accurately this is how we're doing, right? We've gotten a 95 on this or a 63 on this or whatever, right? It's just, it doesn't work like that. So we struggle sometimes with being able to answer the question. So one of the classic arguments with Christianity lies between passages like Romans 1, verses 16 to 17. Linda, do you have that? What is it? Re real loud. So that I have not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, for the righteous will live by faith. Okay, a righteousness that comes by faith, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Galatians chapter two, verse 16. Somebody have that. Yes, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Yeah, nobody is justified by the works of the law. We are justified by faith, period, end of story. And then we have James 2.17, which always messes us up. <laughs> James 2.17, somebody have that? Right, so faith without works is dead. Oh, man. <laughs> Just when I thought I was figuring this out. Again, the Christian church has always lived with this tension. We're justified by faith without the works of the law, right? Justified by grace. And yet, God, if you read the Gospels, Jesus makes it plainly evident that faith ought to mean something. <laughs> faith ought to show up in our life, right? I mean, just, just read the Sermon on the Mount, where, where, G, where Jesus starts blasting the Pharisees for being hypocrites. Why? Because their faith is not showing up and equating in their life, right? Right? So what's the relationship between faith and action? So our next three sessions in this class, we're going to address the topic of do versus done as we consider the Lutheran view on the essence of the gospel message. 
The Bible is filled with action language, with verbs. What makes Lutherans unique in our understanding of the subject of these verbs, particularly with respect to the primary issue of salvation and our relationship with God, considering the following passages, what do they tell us about this relationship? Who is the primary subject enacting these verbs? So if you take a look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, there's a, there's a lot of verses that we're going to go through here. And so uh, you guys on Zoom kind of try to keep up the best you can. Okay. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. If somebody wants to read that, please. Okay, so who is the subject here? Who is doing the thing? God is, right? Okay. Um, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Okay. Uh, again, who is the subject here? Who is the actor? Who is doing the thing? God is, right? Um, John chapter 3, verse 16. Okay, so who is the actor here? God is, right? Um, most of it. <laughs> what else is going on in here? For God so loved that gave the world that he gave his one and only son. God is doing it. He is the actor here. That, then that starts to shift the spotlight away from what God has done to now... It's actually down to us. Right? Okay, we'll come back to that. John 15, 16. Chooses. Two O's and chooses? Okay, anyway. Um, so Jesus says in here, listen, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I chose you to do what? Uh-huh. Come back to that in a minute. Romans 1, 16, we talked about that one already. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. We are saved, how? By grace, through faith, without the works of the law. It's a free gift, right? Right? It's a free, less than anyone should boast, right? However, <laughs> verse 10, somebody have that one, Ephesians 2, verse 10? Yeah. Right. 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 Ingratiates. And great, I'm I'm guess I'm completely guessing on how to spell that word. Ingratiates, yes, ingratiates. Um, yeah, okay. So, First uh, Peter two nine. Okay, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, right? All that kind of stuff. He, he purchased us. That kind of language is in there. Okay, 
Uh, and then finally, First John four ten. Okay, so so the whole concept here, uh, there's always this tension within the Christian church of do versus done. How are we saved? By grace, okay? And, and the message here is that God is the one who does it. He is the actor. He is the subject. He is the one who blesses, who loves, who chooses, who ingratiates, who purchases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He is the actor. He is the one who's doing things. That's what we call the gospel. And if you, if you ever want, just if you're reading a text and somebody asks you the question, um, is this law or gospel? It's real simple to figure out because all you have to do is look at who the subject is. Because for the most part, if, the, if God is the subject, it's usually gospel. Usually, usually. It's usually God blessing and loving and choosing and ingratiating and, and giving and purchasing and giving purpose and, and all those kinds of things, right? It's he, he just pouring up this truck of blessings and just dumping it on us. That's the gospel. And the gospel primarily is in Jesus's life and death and resurrection in the cross, right? But it's not only there, it's in lots of other things as well, okay? When he says to Abraham, I'm gonna bless you that you're gonna be a blessing. And that blessing was not just in Jesus, it was lots of other things as well. Luther talks about in the, in the explanation to the first start of the creed, where he talks about how God has given us our eyes and ears, our reason our senses, our land and animals and wife and children and all this kind of stuff. He's just blessed us. Just why? Out of not any worthiness on my part, but simply out of his divine, loving, fatherly goodness and grace, right? He just loves blessing his kids. Now, for all this, it is our duty to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. Anyway, um, so... Back to the notes, page seven. So Lutherans embrace the tension between what we call law and gospel. Between the command do and the promise done. And the promise specifically linked to Jesus's life, birth, birth, life, death, and resurrection. And the gospel assurance that he issues to us and delivers to us through these promises, okay? All scripture, uh, this is the apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, that says all scripture should be divided into these two chief sections or doctrines, the law and the promises. So basically, uh, what makes Lutherans special and unique and different is that we have this understanding about how God's word is to be divided. God's word is the rule and norm for our faith. We started there last week now, but as we uh, look at God's word, how do we understand it? Well, the, the lens that we use to understand God's word is that we divide it into two chunks. There's the law and there's the gospel. The law is the thing that tells us what to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Is that law or gospel? Law, flat out. Law. Okay? We're saved by grace through faith without the works of the law. Okay, that's, that's gospel. But then in verse 10, it's, but God has got a job for you to do, which is law. It's okay, right? He has works for you to do. Okay. Um, Jesus says, blessed is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. Is that law or gospel? No, 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 no. 
Blessed is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. Now, how do you tell? Okay, a text like that is that law or gospel. Is God the subject of this? Blessed is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. Is God the subject there? No, we are, right? The expectation is that we are doing something here, okay? So if, this, if the text is telling us to do something, we are the actor. If the text is telling us to do something, it's law. Not that there's anything bad with that. That's just what it is. No, it's not a demonstrative statement, right? It's not a, it's not a, law is not a bad thing, okay? It's just, it, it's the understanding about really law and gospel is about who is in charge here? Who is doing things here? Who is the agent? Who is the actor? If it's God delivering promises, it's gospel. If the focus is on us doing something, then it's law. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you, law or gospel. Law, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. Law or gospel. Gospel. See how this works? Got it? Yeah, Debbie. Yes. Yes. That's law, that's law and gospel. So because of what God has done, and now I think we need to be careful there because we have to define what God has done. Sometimes people just lay that out there and assume, right, that we know what we're talking about. Because of what God has done, the way to turn that into a gospel statement is because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, and his life and death and resurrection. That's gospel. The forgiveness, the life of salvation that he gives to each one of us because of Jesus, right? Because of what Jesus has done for us, you know, we, Jesus says, the way that I have loved you, is that law or gospel? That's gospel. So love each other. Is that law or gospel? That's law. Okay, you guys are getting it now, right? You okay. Huh? So, okay, so the Beatitudes. Yeah, the, okay, let's talk about the Beatitudes. Um, good. Okay, so um, blessed are the peacemakers. So uh, they'll be called sons of God. Let me ask you is this law or gospel? It's both and. Yeah, see, this, this is where it gets complicated, right? So blessed are the peacemakers. Is, let me do it that way. Blessed are the peacemakers. Is that law or gospel? No, that's law. Who's, who's the focus of that? Blessed are the peacemakers. We are. Yeah, hold on. Hold on, I'll get there. Okay, hold on, I'll get there. For they shall be called sons of God. Now, is that law or gospel? That's gospel because... God is blessing us, and he is the one who calls us sons of God, right? And that's all we got. We, boy, I could take a whole, yeah, I, we probably need to study the Beatitudes at some point in time and just unpack those things. Yeah, there is an implied subject to that. And, and, and part of what Jesus is doing with the Beatitudes is he actually is, is talking about himself in the Beatitudes. Who's, who's the peacemaker? Jesus is. Yeah, I, that's a, yeah, I don't want to get down into that. Yeah, anyway. So, um, so the, the, the real simple way to tell how to divide the scriptures into law and gospel is simply this. Who is the subject? Who is, who is the actor? Who is the one that's speaking here? And particularly, if you think it's God speaking, is he doing this speaking of blessing and loving and choosing and ingratiating and purpose, purchasing those kinds of things? Then it's gospel, flat out gospel. Okay. Now there, there are plenty of passages um, when God speaks and he is the agent, he is the subject and he ain't talking gospel. 
<laughs> okay. Um, okay, so like Revelation, right? Where he talks about, um, because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Yeah, is that law or gospel? Just to be clear. That would be law. Okay. So yes, God is the subject. God is the author there, but he ain't blessing and loving and choosing and ingratiated. Well, you know, he ain't doing that. He's doing something else. That's law. Okay. So again, the real simple way to figure out what's law and what's gospel is really this construct. What is due, and anytime it's a due passage, it's just law. Anytime it's what God has done, and specifically what Jesus has done with his life and death and resurrection, it's gospel. The, um, so anyway. Now, there's, a, there's another distinction that I want to make with law and gospel here. We talked about when God is the subject or the actor, he is blessing, loving, choosing, ingratiating, purchasing. That's gospel, right? When it's, we are the actor and it's law, it's the do stuff. Martin Luther says that there are three kinds of law. He says there's the curb, there's the mirror, and then there's the rule. The curb is the civic and social use of the law. Uh, and this may not be in your notes. I'm just talking now, okay? Sorry about that for people that are looking on your notes. And Vanya, who's trying to figure out what I'm talking about. So there's the curb, which is the civil and social use of the law, which basically says, listen, the world just works better when people aren't killing each other. The world just works better when people aren't sleeping with each, other, each other's spouses. The world just works better when people aren't stealing each other's stuff, okay? So, and this one applies to everybody, whether they're Christian or not. The second use of the law is what he calls the mirror. And the purpose of the law is this right here. The, the, the main purpose of the law is to act as a mirror to show us our sin and our faults and our failures, where we have fallen short of God's expectations of us. And Luther says, this is the primary use of the law. It's the most powerful use of the law. It is, um, it is the use of the law that, that you know, that, um, that the Holy Spirit works through the most to prepare our hearts to hear the gospel, okay? Um, so you go back and you read things like, um, you know, Sermon on the Mount. Um, and you read about, um, you know, if, if you're, um, you know, you've heard it said, um, hate your enemies. No. No, you've heard it say, you know, love the people who love you back, right? But I tell you, love your enemies. Okay. Now, is that law or gospel? Right? It's law. Now, um, the thing about this, when it's this use of the law, is when we start to think about, okay, how do I treat my enemies? Do I really love them? And I, I have messed this one up from time to time. That's the second use of the law. Tell us that we fall short, right? God wants us to love our enemies, and guess what? We haven't. You know, Vanya, you're on the Facebook page, right? You're sharing that with everybody. Just saying. Vanya's over there multitasking. That's the second use of the law, by the way. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Man, she's going to kill me. The third use of the law is the teaching use of the law, which is, as Christians, how do we love each other? Right? How do we love each other? And the Bible tells us all kinds of stuff about how do we love each other. In fact, my argument is that the Ten Commandments our third use of the law. Basically, what God says is, I to the people of the, the Hebrew people, I have brought you out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. I have kept, taken you by the hand with uh, you know mighty acts of stuff, and I've brought you. I can't remember, and I've brought you to this place. Right now, is that law or gospel? 
It's gospel, flat out gospel, right? I want to be your God and I want you to be my people, right? That's gospel. Great, incredible gospel language. And now within that gospel language, he says, okay, now let me teach you how to love me and love each other, right? Um, don't use my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Pick up your underwear. <laughs> Clean the dishes. No, it's, I'm serious. I, 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 I'm joking, I, but I'm serious. I, what it is, it's, it's a marriage ceremony. God says, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. It's this great marriage language that God uses throughout the entire Bible, but especially in this text in Ephesians chapter six. He's saying, listen, I, I brought you here to be my people. You are now my bride. I want to love you. I want you to love me back. And the people say, yes, absolutely. And God says, here's how to do it. Don't use my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Don't kill each other. Don't sleep around on each other. Don't steal each other's stuff. Don't covet. It's kind of like when we got married and we made these great promises to each other to be faithful and to be devoted and to love each other throughout all the days of our lives through the best and worst of others to come. And then within that, what do we say? Pick up your underwear. Clean the dishes. You know? Every now and then, let's go out and have a date night. It's law. It is absolutely law, but it's within the context of gospel. Okay? Got it? You with me? All right. So, um, so that we talk about do versus done. We talk about law versus gospel. That's what makes us Lutheran. So every time you hear me preach, there's going to be law stuff, there's going to be gospel stuff. And I'm a little different than maybe some pastors because when some pastors went to seminary, they said the first half of your sermon should be law and the second half of your sermon should be gospel. Well, that kind of gets boring after a while. And when, I'm, and when I've had a really bad week, that's what I'll do. <laughs> the first half of my sermon will be law, the second half will be gospel. You can tell when I hear you give a law gospel sermon that's just that way, you can say, yep, Matt had an awful week, week right? But our, our lives as Christians, the law and the gospel are about a dance, right? It's just, again, it's like being married, right? Law and gospel is a dance. It's not, I do not spend the first half of my day with Diane in law and the second half of my day in gospel. There are days in my life where it's all law. There are days in my life where it's all gospel. And then there are lots of days where it's the dance. And it's the same thing with God. It's the same thing with our relationship with him and our relationship with each other. Same thing in my messages. I tend to dance. I'll spend a couple of minutes in law, a couple of minutes in gospel, a couple of minutes in law, a couple of minutes in gospel, and you'll see how I end up. There's times where I end with the law. Get it together, folks. In the love of Jesus, get it together. And then there are times I'll end it in gospel. Okay? It's a dance. It's a tension. Um, oh, man, I'm sorry. That clock's early. <laughs> I have like three minutes left. Okay. So um, uh, to be sure that this is the bottom of page seven in your notes, to be sure this dynamic is a polarity that needs to be managed for the Bible and Jesus himself speak both law and gospel. Um, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says these great words that anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who, who built his house on the rock the winds came, the storms came, and, not, and the, anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man who builds his house on the stand and all that kind of stuff. Is that law or gospel? It's actually law. It's actually law. Okay. Now, that particular text is law. Now, if you go back 
And it's the summary. That's the, 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 the bookend summary of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you go back and say, well, which words of mine are we talking about? And you actually go back and read what he's talking about. Again, Jesus does this great dance of law and gospel all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. You know, he talks about how God blesses us and chooses us and forgives us. And then he talks about how do we express that and live it out in our lives. It's law and gospel. Now, I want to do this real quick. Uh, again, um, one of the things that I drive the staff nuts about is this thing called polar polarity management. Um, and how did I do it here? Did I do law? And then, okay, so law is up here. Gospel is over here. Sorry. The question is, uh, the question is, how do we live in this place where it's law and gospel and this dance with each other? Okay. I'm going to call this the discipleship zone, where we have law and gospel living together in our lives, okay? If we have high law and low gospel, that's legalism, where you have to do something to be saved. If you have low gospel, Oh, boy, I messed that up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. If you have high law, low gospel, that's legalism. You guys are ready to kill me now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you have high gospel and low law, that's cheap grace. Uh, the great Bonhoeffer term. God loves you. You don't have to do a thing about it. Cheap grace. Cheap grace, right? God loves you. He's going to forgive you. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you got to be very, very careful with that kind of thinking. Um, low gospel, high law, that's legalism. And then if you got low, low law and low gospel, you got nothing really. Uh, I, that's, I, that's where I call Unitarianism, actually. Yes, uh, uh, that's, that's basically Unitarianism, where it doesn't matter. Figure it out yourself. Yeah. How do you know if God loves me? I, here, you have no idea. How do you know what God wants me to do? Here, you have no idea, because there's no law, there's no gospel. Okay. So uh, um, one of the things that when it's done well, when it's done right, if, if you read Luther's stuff, he is high law and high gospel. Uh, he, he has um, very strong words for people when they are over here in this area of cheap grace, where it's just God loves us so much, but he doesn't demand anything of us. Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up this now, okay? So um, the last thing in the notes, <laughs> it's okay. I believe this is one of the things that really distinguishes Lutherans as Lutherans, is that our, our understanding of dividing God's word into law and gospel, okay? Okay. Um, that we know that we are saved by grace through faith without the works of the law, and yet we still know that God expects us to do stuff. Not to get saved, but as an outpouring of our salvation. Not to become children of God, but as an expression of our children, uh, as being children of God, of our identity as children of God. It's kind of like being married. It, it's it just, that's, again, God uses that illustration all throughout the scriptures, right? You, 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 how do you get married? You, you don't enter a contract with each other. Well, some people do, but marriage should be, we're doing this because we just, we love each other. We're devoted to each other. And we just, we, you know, we have this gospel relationship with each other, right? But now within that relationship, we pick up our underwear, right? That's actually, no, that's, 
I was actually going to say something that will get me in a lot of trouble with my wife. That's law. <laughs> That's law. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's an interesting statement. And why is that? Okay. So what Debbie said is that uh, in the in the eight years that she's member, been a member at Redeemer, her expectations have risen. Now, to be clear, is that law or gospel? No, it's actually law. The expectations on her have risen. That's law. But I ask the question, why? I think, I hope at least because of the gospel. And you see, that's what the gospel does. The gospel speaks to the heart. It, the gospel, and I think one of the things I love about our Lutheran theology is that it focuses so much on Jesus and his love and grace and forgiveness that it cannot help but produce fruit from the heart. Listen, I can say, and I'm going to pick on the Baptists for a second. And I apologize. I can say drinking and no dancing and no smoking and no fun forever is that law or gospel law but it does nothing to change the heart in fact if you've ever had kids and you say to them don't do this what can you guarantee they're going to do that right why because you can say don't do this all day long and you've not changed the heart one of the things that the gospel does is it changes the heart and from that flows a whole wealth of faithfulness. Yeah, Beth, real quick. So there are, uh, what I've gotten at is the first question, how do you make this effect? Yes. It goes back to the boundaries that we're trying to do. Yes. Yes. Shows that we the way, and then it, I bounce against the law, faith, and grace, and all these things that we're doing. We can't measure in our world, right? So spiritually, we get the big change, and then I go, I want to drink. Well, hang on. Yeah. And that makes me stop. Sure. The the boundary stuff that we've been working on, which is what Beth is talking about, and I got to do this real fast. The boundaries thing that we've been working on is actually first use of the law. Okay. Back to the first use of the law. The, the 10 laws of boundaries are first use of the law. They apply to Christians or non-Christians. They're great, good psychology, family systems kind of stuff, right? Really good stuff. The purpose of, say, the law of sowing and reaping is not to just be a good curb for our behavior, but also the second use of the law is to show us where we've messed it up. And here's the beauty of what Luther talks about with second use of the law. The second use of the law shows us our sin and shows us we need a savior and that Jesus has come and he is that savior. The purpose of the second use of the law is to drive us to the gospel. And what Luther says is that you've got three uses of the law, but you know what? All of them point back to the second use, which drives us to Jesus. And we will talk more about that next week. All right. Man, this is fun. Um, by the way, this is recorded. Uh, it's on the YouTube channel. These, these classes will go up on the YouTube channel. Uh, uh, this class will go up on the YouTube channel. So if you want to see them afterwards and pick me apart for stuff, that's law, by the way. Um, you can go on the YouTube channel, on Redeemer's YouTube channel, and, and see all these things and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, cool. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, when we come to you this day and we give you thanks and praise for your word. 
And as you help us to understand how to rightly divide your word into law and gospel, we ask that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts, in our minds to change us, to speak the sweetness of your gospel to us, how you love us, how you forgive us, how you sent your son Jesus to die for us on a cross, to save us, sure, absolutely. And that's incredible enough, but also to prepare us to do the good works that you have placed before us. So Lord, this week, as we prepare to do those works, move through us in our conversations with friends and neighbors and family members, work through us, make your love come alive inside of us that we might love and serve others as well. So again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for our conversation. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. See you soon.